Okay, good evening everybody. Welcome to this evening's Café Med. Uh, my name is Ian Stansfield. Uh, I'm a professor of molecular biology in the School of Medicine, Medical Sciences and Nutrition. And I'm this evening's introducer and host for the Café Med. Um, Café Med, as you know, is an opportunity for uh, researchers in the university and our clinical colleagues from across in the hospital to come and talk to you, the audience, about some of the exciting uh, medical science uh, investigations and research going on in the university in collaboration with clinical colleagues. So tonight we're going to hear from uh, a couple of colleagues from, who work with me within the school, uh, Daniel Berg and Yunshai Kang, and they're going to be talking to us about some of the exciting research going on in their laboratories related to the nervous system. But perhaps just before I hand over to them to talk to you about their research, just to say a couple of things about the, the background to the Café Med idea. It is to get across this concept of how the latest discoveries in the research uh, area within medical sciences are contributing to the advancement of medical sciences. And of course, if we go back um, 100 years to, uh, I guess, the dawn of modern medicine, um, we were perhaps still uh, in the era of leeches, bloodletting, and other very primitive uh, aspects to the treatment of disease. Um, what we have now from an understanding of uh, cancer and its treatment, the understanding of uh, diagnosis of disease, medical um, resonance imaging, MRI, and other uh, modern techniques have all come about because of research in the area of medicine. And so the kind of thing you're going to hear about tonight is all aimed at uh, picking up that link between the, the research that's going on within the university and indeed the hospital and the, the advances which progress forward to the clinic over the course of, of the years as that research develops. So it's a great pleasure uh, this evening to welcome the first of our speakers, Daniel Berg. And Daniel's going to tell us a little bit about um, the nervous system, his research in that area, and how nervous system uh, generation of new neurons happens in the adult brain. So, um, Daniel, if I can invite you to come up and take over and tell us about your research and how that feeds into medical discovery. Thank you very much, Ian. So, th the last time I gave a talk like this and I put it on YouTube, I put the title as how you can make new neurons in your brain. And that YouTube video go got 46,000 views and lots of angry comments complaining that I didn't tell them how to make new neurons. So I'm, we're going to be a bit more careful today. And I'm going to, maybe I can't help you with your, to make new neurons, but I can teach, I can talk to you about what we've learned about the adult brain and how the adult brain can actually can produce new neurons. So when I went to school, I learned that I had to be very careful when I headed the ball or when I, any damage to the brain, I had to be very careful because all the neurons that I have when, when I was after development, these are the neurons that I'm going to keep throughout life. So no new neurons are made after development. I'm not saying that you shouldn't be careful about your brain. You should be very careful with your brain. It's the most valuable thing we have. But actually, it isn't true. New neurons are generated in the brain, even into adulthood. It's estimated that in your brain today, at least 1,700 new neurons are newly born today. But that's in just very specific areas of the brain. So how come that when I went to school, we didn't know that new neurons were being generated? So this is because one famous neuroscientist named Ramon y Cajal, a Spanish guy, he developed lots of fancy techniques at the time. So what he could do, he could, in a, taking a piece of brain, he could label very few neurons, and then he could see the beautiful structure of these cells. So then he could look, for the first time in human history, he, we could see the shape of these individual neurons and see what they looked like. And he was a remarkable neuroscientist and a remarkable scientist. 
he got the Nobel Prize, but he couldn't see any dividing cells. So he didn't think there were any, in the adult brain, he didn't think there were any newborn cells because he couldn't see any dividing cells. And because he was such a powerful scientist and because people looked up to him for so, so much, for 70 years, it was this concept that after development, no neurons are generated. It was held like a dogma, a central dogma in the field of neuroscientists. People didn't even try to find dividing cells in the adult brain because he was so influential. So it, it took some new technology for us to find that this isn't the case. And the new technology was a small little molecule called titrated thymidine. So what's cool with this, uh, uh, this little molecule is that if you give it to an animal or if you put it on a dish of growing cells, every cell that is dividing and making more cells is going to take this up, this molecule up, and then you can look at the brain and see which are the cells that have been generated. So a guy called Joseph Altman, he decided, I can make use of this new technology, and I can inject it into mice or rats, and then look at their brains. So he did that, and he looked at their brains, and he could find two areas of the mouse brain where new neurons were generated, even in the adult. One of these areas is the olfactory bulb, so that's in the front of the brain, and that's connected to the nose and olfaction, because mice, as you know, they have used their nose a lot to sense their environment. And the other area is the dentate gyrus of the hippocampus. And the hippocampus is a very important part in our brain, because it's involved in learning and memory. And in, in the mouse, at least, he was able to see newborn neurons in this hippocampus. But because of this first scientist, Ramon y Cajal, people didn't believe these results. They didn't think, um, they didn't believe it was true. And this guy he had very difficulties getting funding for his research and the field as a whole didn't believe it. So it took even more technology was needed for us to, to be able to study this in detail. And it took someone who wasn't working on mammals, they weren't working on mice or rats, they were working on birds. Because this scientist called Fernando Nottebum, he knew that birds, they learn different songs each year. Some birds do like canary birds. They learn different songs every year. And his hypothesis was that in this area of the brain controlling the song, new neurons must be generated. So he had a look. And in the, in the bird brain, he could find new neurons being generated. And the field could accept this. Birds, they're, they're far away from humans. They're not mammals. So we the neuroscientists said, oh, birds, that's OK. We believe that new neurons are generated in the adult birds. And he developed new techniques to look to see which, where these neurons came from. And they, he could identify the stem cell, the neuronal stem cell in the bird brain. And he developed all these techniques for the birds. But now people started using these techniques and looking in mouse and looking in, in other mammals. And they could see this is actually true. What Joseph Altman had discovered 20, 30 years ago was true. There are two places in the mammalian brain where new neurons are continuously added. And that's the olfactory bulb and the hippocampus. So one, what I would like to highlight there is the need for new techniques. Every time this big step in discovery has been made, there are new techniques that have been developed. And we're going to hear from Dr. Kang later on about one of these new techniques and how it can really push forward what we know about the brain. Another, another thing I would like to highlight is this field holding us back. So the old professors, I'm not looking at Ian here, but I'm not, this is a joke. Uh, 
these old professors in the field saying this is not, um, they believe in their old, what they always have believed in. So new people need to come along and push it forward. So I've told you about what we've seen in birds and in mice, but what about humans? How can we study this in humans? It's very difficult because people are very reluctant to give away pieces of the brain. We like to keep it to ourselves and we don't want to hurt our brain. But we can look at the human brain once people have deceased and then we can pick those cells that we're interested in and we can uh, birth date them. So I think you've all heard about carbon-14 dating, this system where we can measure the carbon-14 and we date archaeological. If we find something from a very long time ago, we can measure the carbon-14 and see how old it is. This doesn't work really well for human tissue because we're so young, but it turned out that the Russians and the Americans in the 50s and 60s they used a lot of atomic bombs, and they did a, a lot of atomic above ground atomic bomb testing, which led to a huge spike in the carbon-14 in the atmosphere. And this spike can we, we can now use to determine when cells are born in the body. So a cell that's, if this is the spike, you can imagine, if the cell is born here, the DNA in this cell contains about this much carbon-14. And using this technique, scientists have been able to see that actually the dentate gyrus, new neurons are added in this human <coughs> dentate gyrus. And I've uh, promised you that I'm gonna tell you a bit how we can uh, boost neurogenesis. How can we activate these stem cells in the human brain? With mouse, we've learned that if we put a running wheel in the mouse cage, the mouse is gonna run like crazy. All night, the mouse is gonna be running on that running wheel, more than 10 kilometers in one night, because they really love the exercise and they love running. But, and if you put this running wheel in the, in the mouse cage, this is gonna create a big boost of new neurons being born in the brain. So exercise is good for the brain and running has been shown to boost and activate these neural stem cells in the brain. Another thing is that we can put lots of toys, lots of different toys in the cage to enrich the environment. That's learn, making the mouse learn new things and seeing new things that also increases the survival of these new neurons and boosts neurogenesis. So my one take home message for you tonight is like, exercise is gonna boost neurogenesis, but also every time you go running, go running in different, different uh, parts of the uh, Aberdeen and this is gonna increase the survival of your neurons. Neurogenesis in the hippocampus isn't only something that is uh, involved in learning a memory, it's also associated with depression. So they have seen in animal studies that depressed mice have reduced levels of neurogenesis in the dentate gyrus, in, this, in the hippocampus. So there's this strong hypothesis at the moment that, that um, neurogenesis is linked with depression. Because if you treat these sad mice with antidepressant, this is gonna boost neurogenesis and it's also gonna relieve them of their symptoms. So depression leads to reduced, <coughs> depression is associated with reduced levels of newborn neurons, but we can boost that with antidepressant and that seems to make them happier. But also exercise is a good way of treating depression and also exercise, as I said before, running is a good way to boost it. So there's a strong hypothesis there between um, uh, depression and, and uh, neurogenesis in the adult 
Dante Gyrus of the hippocampus. But and finally, I'd like to just talk about, uh, I said that neurogenesis in this area is involved in learning and memory. And when we think about diseases with learning and memory, one disease that comes to mind is Alzheimer's disease, of course, when we start forgetting things and not learning new things. And it's been shown that people who have Alzheimer's have much fewer newborn neurons in the dentate gyrus. So it's probably not the whole part of the disease. It's many aspects of the brain is affected by Alzheimer's disease. But one part of the disease is this, when it, is this neurogenesis and is clearly affected in Alzheimer's patients. So one thing we're trying to do in the lab is trying to see how Alzheimer's disease affects these neurons and how we can rescue this, this, these stem cells and boost the neurogenesis with, with the hope to alleviate some symptoms of the disease. But one problem is that I've been talking a lot about mice models. We, we use mice and we use other animals. But the fact is that these animal models are very different in some aspects from the human brain. So we want to have a system where we can study this adult neurogenesis in the human brain. And I now hand over to Dr. Kang, who uh, has developed such methods and is working with such methods. Thank you, Daniel. <laughs> Hi, um, hello everyone. My name is um, Eunche Kang. Um, so I, today I'm going to talk about brain, of course. Um, but um, before that, I want to uh, talk about how our brain is so different from animal. So um, the first civilization arose like um, five to uh, six thousand ago in the Mesopotamia area. And, but then the oldest um, known cave painting discovered is uh, actually 33,600 years ago. So that was like a, um, Altamira cave in Spain. And then in the painting actually, um, a, there are so uh, delicate, like a description of different kinds of animal, and then they even used colors to describe different parts, different parts of animal. So since it was such a high quality of painting, I mean, scientific society, they didn't believe like it's actually authentic painting. They thought, oh, it's all forgery. Probably it's like uh, uh, painted very recently. But actually, um, scientists proved it's an actual like authentic uh, painting and 33,600 years ago. What does that mean? Um, that means even like a prehistoric man, they had the intellectual ability um, to generate any type of like artistic expression. So unlike any, any other animals, we started like a live, um, living, our ancestors living uh, footprints on the earth, but now we living footprints on the moon. How come we are so different from like all other animals? Um, and have you ever seen cartoons like uh, two prehistoric men like uh, talking to each other and then one man saying like, uh, oh, I invented uh, money, then I cannot afford anything now. So <laughs> yeah, so human um, like uh, invented so many things, like language, letters, and all different kinds of machine, and this camera and the mic, and you know, we create all sorts of things, even including philosophy and then even purse arts. So how, how come human is so different? The, this is because the answer is the human brain. So human brain is a very um, complicated structure. So nerve cells in the brain are called neurons, and these neurons in the brain connected to each other and then send the signal and then send the message through these connections. And then in the brain, can you guess how many neurons are in the human brain? Yeah? 
yes, close. So there are 86 billion neurons in the human brain and then 85 billion non-neuronal cells. And the human brain, I have this model here, uh, this human brain weighs 1.4 kilogram. And then here, like uh, 86 billion neurons, like all densely packed in this brain. And then each neuron, they, on average, they have like 7,000 of synap synaptic connections. So imagine there are 86 billion neurons and then each neuron have 7,000 connections. So imagine how like a complete, uh, how um, it, they, all these connections are compli very complicated manner connected to each other. But like most of this information about human brain is actually from animal. And typically, it's mouse. And I'll show you this. This is mouse brain. Can you even see? And can you even see how different? Oh, sorry, between this human brain and this tiny mouse brain. It's very different. So. Um, human brain is like a 3,500 times bigger than this tiny mouse brain, and then 1,000 times more neurons the human brain has than mouse. So the complexity of the human brain is extremely different from mouse brain. And also, as the human brain gets more complicated, uh, we, we humans, um, more susceptible to different like uh, uh, brain disease as well. So why we are learn a lot from these animal models, the actually characteristic that makes the human human brain so unique, still like remains mysterious to us. But then the main challenge of studying human brain is unlike all other organ. The human brain is very different from animal model system, but we cannot really uh, access to human brain to study it. But what if we can culture human brain cells in a dish? And that's what I do in my lab. Um, so probably many of you heard the stem cell. So what is a stem cell? So stem cell, is the cell has like uh, all the capacity to generate any types of cells. It can be blood cells, it can be intestine cell, it can be um, heart cell. So, so traditionally, um, scientists um, used the embryonic stem cell, but there was uh, some ethical issue, and in some country, um, it became illegal to use the human embryonic tissue. So scientists tried to find, okay, how to then we can make a stem cell. So they, uh, and then some, one Japanese scientist found the important factors so they can reprogram any cell into stem cell. So that's we called induced pluripotent stem cell. So nowadays, typically we take, take the skin cell, tiny bit of a skin cell, and then we culture, add the special factors, and we program, and then make them into a induced pluripotent stem cell. So that technique revolutionized, revolutionized the field dramatically, and then who, uh, the scientist who found this factor who won the Nobel Prize in 2012. So this induced pluripotent stem cell now can generate the, any types of cell. And, and then we neuroscientists, we differentiate this stem cell into the human uh, brain cell, including neurons. So beauty of this system is now we have some patients maybe going through the neurodegenerative disease, such as Alzheimer's disease, and take their skin and then make a stem cell out of their skin cell. 
and then differentiate into brain cell. And then we can, we can examine what's going on in their brain cell. So traditionally, um, people generate the human brain cell like in, in this kind of 2D culture. So you can see this like a, a human brain cell can grow on the bottom of the culture dish. But actually, if you think about your brain, it's not two dimensional, it's three dimensional, right? So very recently, people developed a new technique can culture the brain cell into three dimensionally. And then this ball of the three dimensional clump of these cell actually have like all kinds of the cells in the brain and that actually organized same as actual uh, brain has. So we call it brain organoids. <clears throat> and the nickname of this brain organoids is mini brain in a dish. But actually, we're not like making whole brain in a dish. We only generate the part of a brain in a dish. So it depends on like um, what kind of a factor you add. You can generate the cortical organoid, or you can even make a hippocampal organoid. So one thing we can do, as Daniel mentioned, in the hippocampus, there are like continuous neurogenesis is occurring but we can even examine that phenomenon in a dish, in a 3D-dimensional ball, ball of this um, hippocampal organoid. So, so using this special platform of the human cell, so what do we do? So in the lab, <coughs> we can uh, look at the different genetic factors, how that affect the brain development, and that what kind of a process, process of a brain development is disturbed, and that leads to the neurodevelopmental disorders, such as schizophrenia, um, autism spectrum disorder, or like microcephaly, all these kind of like a neurodevelopmental disorder we can investigate. So one example, uh, we are looking at the how maternal immune activation affect the brain development, and then that leads to the neurodevelopmental disorders. Because there are a um, uh, lot of epidemiological study, so when mom has an infection, um, that leads to the activation of immune system during pregnancy, um, their offspring has a higher chance to have a, a neurodevelopmental disorder like autism spectrum disorder. So in our study, we using this brain organoids and then culture and then mimic the condition of a maternal immune activation system and then see what kind of like a developmental process is disturbed and then what's the molecular mechanism behind the special phenomenon of the special cellular phenotypes. So that's what uh, we are uh, <coughs> studying in the lab. So another example is we study Alzheimer's disease. There are many known uh, genetic factors of Alzheimer's disease. And some gene, and specific like a type of gene, increase the risk of Alzheimer's disease. Well-known gene is APOE. And then we have like a different like a variation of the, this APOE form. And then we have <coughs> different induced proliferative the stem cell expressing different form of this gene, and then reculture into the cortical organoids and hippocampal organoids, and then see how this specific genetic form contribute to the pathogenesis of the Alzheimer's disease. <coughs> and another example is like, uh, there are like a, some kind of a neurodevelopmental disorder showing a very uh, distinct anatomical defect such as like a um, microcephaly, that's the kind of smaller brain. So there is a certain pedigree showing that um, they, all these kids have like a microcephaly phenotype and the intellectual disability. It turned out they all have like a specific mutation in the genes called the metal 5. So 
we kind of like express this mutant form in the brain organoid and then see what kind of process is disturbed and then how that leads to um, microcephaly phenotype in, in the actual patients. It turned out like this specific gene like affect the behavior of the neural stem cell that leads to the uh, smaller brain in the patients. So these are the examples like how we study the uh, brain disease using the human brain organoids. So beauty of this system is, or aim of this using this system and then studying brain disease is eventually we want to have the personalized medicine. What does that mean is we have patients with a, with a specific disease. Let's say we have Alzheimer's disease patients with a specific genetic mutation. And then what kind of a drug would work best for that patient? Can we actually screen the drug using this like a three-dimensional culture of the human brain from like this specific patient? And can we actually test the efficacy of the certain drug using that platform? So we hope to promise, uh, we have hope like uh, so using this kind of like a very advanced technique, we can find the medicine and we can find the actual mechanism of many disease and then find the specific target and then develop the drug, but also actually whether we can eventually test the specific efficacy of the certain drug for, for each patient. So, so that's uh, what we do in the lab, and thank you for your attention.